But his point was, uh, Rob, uh, Robert Witkin, is that there is a world that exists whether or not we exist. Um, it's the outer world of objects and events and physicality and of other people. But he said, there is also a world that exists only because you exist. It's the world that came into being when you did and will end or change according to your beliefs when your physical being ceases to be. Um, it's the world of your private consciousness, of your own being. And whereas we all make attempts to know the outside world, nobody can truthfully know the detail of your inner world. It's the world that Ardy Lang once said, in which there's only really one set of footprints. It's your own inner world of consciousness. Um, well, what we constantly try to do is to bridge these two. We try to relate the one to the other. We try to often to understand ourselves in terms of the other. I think the problems that have arisen in education because of our obsession with a certain type of rationalism is that we spend a great deal of time in education now getting children focused on the external world, giving them data and information about it. And increasing that world is becoming more and more distracting and kaleidoscopic um, and insistent. I'm sure that is one of the contributions to people's lack of attention, uh, the constant flickering of data. But our education systems are remorselessly turned outwards to the outer world. When what kids and all of us desperately need to is time to look inward and to dwell in that inner space where in the end um, we find the only things that truthfully make sense for us. And education is increasingly poor at giving people techniques to look inward and to understand the relationship between the two. You see, science, if I can caricature it, seems to me the primary purpose of science, and I'm a great advocate for science education, but the primary, and I've written a lot about the creativity of science, but broadly speaking, sciences, broadly speaking, the physical sciences, are directed to understanding the external world in its own terms. It seems to me that the enterprise of science is explanation. We're trying to figure things out and to be as objective as we can. I don't think objective means true, and we might talk about that. You can be objective and wrong. And the history of science is of people being perfectly objective but wrong, um, but trying to be right. Uh, but people have often believed things to be factually correct, which turn out to be nonsense. Um, the role of the arts, I think, is, is self-consciously to manage this relationship between the inner and outer world. It's to, and the, the aim of an artist is not so much to explain their experience, but to describe it, to give an account of it in objects that somehow convey that sense of perception. Well, I think we pay a high price for the exile of feeling in education this remorse is turning out and the failure to help people engage with what's within them. I believe that what identifies us as human beings above all are the powers that flow from our uh, deep resource of imagination. That's why I write such a lot about creativity. If you ask, you know, for, the, for most of the past 50,000 years, we have lived harmoniously with the rest of life on Earth. Our ancestors did. In the last 300 years, which is a blink of an eye, we've taken off like a rocket and are about to bring the house down around our ears. And what accounts for it? What is it that makes us so different? Because in most respects, we're like the rest of life on Earth. We're mortal, organic, no different from them. Lives are short. But what makes us different? Why are we sitting in a building that we've made, you know, rather than sitting outside while all the dogs are sitting in here? You know, or... <laughs> You know, all, all the lemurs and the squirrels sitting out in meetings and we're outside in the trees trying to figure out what to eat. You know, there is a difference. And the difference is that we have evolved this powerful sense of imagination, the ability to bring to mind things that aren't here. And from it flow all kinds of powers, like creativity, and uniquely and distinctively the power of empathy. The ability to put yourself in somebody else's position and to imagine what that might be like. What happens in all times of conflict and cruelty is we shut empathy off so that we can do things that are unimaginable. And the way we avoid that is by kindling our imaginations and making those things unimaginable in turn. 
Empathy, essentially, in imagination, are the things that make us human, and the powers that flow from it, creativity and intuition. So it seems to me we have two big challenges in education. One of them is to have a more unified conception of what it is to be a person. One that recognises that feeling and knowing are parts of the same complex of a whole being, that our feelings are forms of perception, and they're affected by what we think, by our frameworks of ideas. They're affected by how well we can express ourselves and the languages we have available to do that. So part of the task of education is to connect ourselves with ourselves. And I think the reason so many people get depressed and lost is they have lost the connection with themselves. They have no sense of purpose. Carl Jung said this. He said in his 30 years of professional practice, he said there wasn't a single person who came to see him whose uh, malaise, he said, couldn't in the end be attributed to a loss of faith in religion. Now, I don't think he meant, and I certainly don't mean in quoting him, organised religion. I think the word I would use, and perhaps he would have accepted, would be spirituality, a sense of your spirit. But he said, in the end, nobody either, nobody either got well without regaining a sense of spiritual connection. So part of the task of education is to connect ourselves with ourselves. But the other great task is to connect with each other through the power of empathy, uh, through the power of um, intuition and mutuality. And all those things get lost in, in, in an industrialised, homogenised, atomised system of education. And the price couldn't be higher. And we're paying it every day in disaffection, disengagement and emotional turmoil. Now, I don't say education is the whole of it, but we contribute to it. Um, it's the old Marxist principle, isn't it? You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And we have to be careful not to be part of the problem. So what do we do about it? So let me queue up the conversation I hope we're going to have. I think, at any rate, there are uh, a number of practical strategies we should think about. The first is that we have to recognise that education is personal. If you make education impersonal, people pull away from it or pull out of it or just disengage. It interests me that all the remedial programmes in education are based on personalised curricula. I was at a meeting in LA the other week about alternative education to get kids back into school. Alternative education is based on always the same thing, always the same thing, on personalised curricula, on um, close working relationships between teachers and students, negotiated programmes, and collaboration, group work, and mutual support. And I remember saying to this meeting, it's interesting that's called alternative education. Because <laughs> that's really education. It's the alternative that's causing the problem. <laughs> you know, we should call all the mainstream stuff alternative education and get on to the, the good stuff. I, I feel this, by the way, in all the work I, I do, I, I feel I stand in a very long tradition of people who've been arguing for something like this for a very long time. Um, you can, there are precursors and ancestors for every argument I ever think I put, you know, whether it's Brunner or Piaget or Montessori or... Um, or Pestalozzi or Friebel, all in their different ways. People have been arguing for holistic approaches to education since we had education. It's just the mainstream has rocketed away into this, uh, on these rails of conformity. And I think it's time to make the alternative into the mainstream. So personalising is a big piece of it, and we might talk a bit about that. The second is, I believe, we have to put the arts back into education. The arts are not only, but among the prime ways in which we um, negotiate our own understanding of ourselves and the world around us. It's through music and art and theatre and dance, all the things that are marginalised, uh, that we express our own unique individual humanity. Not just doing them, but learning about them, learning about other cultures through them, and creating our own unique forms of expression in the process. The arts should be at the centre of this. Not instead of, but foursquare alongside the humanities and the sciences and physical education. I think a school that marginalises the arts is not doing education. They might be doing something else, some version of it, but if you leave out of account one of these major areas of human growth and development, then you're not doing the job. It's, I think it's as simple as that. And the final thing is this, that we, can, we are learning more and more through studies of the brain, through the fusions of ancient meditative uh, processes, um, about what's increasingly being called mindfulness. Uh, there are practical things, techniques that we can use in classrooms to get children to focus in on themselves, to create some calm in their lives, some points of meditation, some points of practice, which if they became routine, 
I think, uh, would start to show themselves in the change in the overall culture of education. And uh, we're going to be hearing some more about those in the conversation we're about to have. But those particular things seem to me at the heart of it. They're all versions of personalising education. But the root of it to me is that they all point to a different metaphor for education. You see, most of our systems of education are mechanistic, I think. They're kind of uh, data-driven and, um, and impersonal. The trouble is that human beings are not mechanisms, we are organisms. And schools are like organisms too. And if you create certain cultures, people flourish, and in other cultures they tend to feel demeaned and to pull away. So to me, it's about looking again at the nature of the culture of the school, the vibrancy of the school, recognising that we're all unique individuals, but that together we create unique patterns and forms of behaviour which we can change. I've seen terrible schools improve in the space of six months when a new te head teacher came in and saw the potential to make people work differently. I've seen great schools go down for the opposite reason. Schools have much more freedom, I think, than we often believe we do. Um, there's nothing, I think, in the legislation we all operate within that says that you have to have 40-minute periods in high schools, that you have to have separate subject departments. How the school is run is really about the leadership of the school and the collective will of the people who work within it. But there's, we pay a high price for the current system, but there's a great prize in the new one. There was a wonderful quote. Do you remember Anais Nin, the poet? She once said, and interesting, she used an organic metaphor. She said of herself that there came a point in her own, her own life, in a way, where she had to be true to herself. She said, there came a point when the pain of remaining tight in a bud was greater than the pain it took to blossom. I just thought that was lovely. Um, but I think it's true in, for all of us that very often the, the pain of containing uh, our consciousness or our failure to understand ourselves is greater than the pain it would take to go on the journey to make it happen. And I think that's true in schools. The pain of containing people who are being disengaged is more than the effort it would take to reconnect with them if we changed our metaphors. And I think if we do, I think as we sit here at this point in humanity's growth and development, um, we may be feeling that shift. I know Eckhart Tolle writes about that, but he calls, he subtitles his book, uh, A New Earth, a f The Flowering of Human Consciousness. It's, again, it's an organic metaphor. But I think it's true. I feel a shift as I go around the world, and I, th I think you can sense it in lots of ways that people are doing. It's often a long revolution, but I think it's beginning to unfold. But if we go with it, if we understand that these things are our making and that we can remake them, that education and human life is organic and it's a matter of culture, if we get the culture right, then I think we'll witness a harvest of human flourishing that will amaze us. Thank you.